Welcome to the Value Investor Chatter Podcast. My name is Becco and my co-host Hari. Hello. Welcome to this podcast, everybody. We are today going to be talking about two of our recommendations that we put out over the last few weeks, and we're going to talk about Alibaba. All right, so let's dive right into it. Hari, start us off with uh, the disclaimer. This is the Value Investor Chatter Podcast. We are the podcast that um, is about education and understanding how uh, investing works. We are not financial advisors and we don't know your specific tax situation. So please consult with the appropriate advisor before making uh, any financial decisions. So in this podcast, we're going to talk about two different companies that we put out as part of our recommendation for Value Investor Gold members. And then we're going to, as I talked about earlier, we're going to talk about this company, Alibaba. So on the Value Investor membership, really quickly, so for those of you who don't know, we have this Value Investor community where you get access to our own stock recommendations. These are our own, Hari and I, our personal picks, as well as a place to discuss them. And then uh, we have a monthly meetup where we talk about the companies that we, uh, that we put out there, as well as any questions that you guys might have about anything related to investing. So uh, if you're not part of the member, please consider joining us. Um, we have a lot, we'll, we have a lot to offer in the community. So definitely check that out. And if the community is not for you, that's totally fine. Check out our website. There's a lot of good stuff in there. Uh, there is a free value investor database where we scrape SEC filings so that you don't have to look through 10 Ks. Um, all the fundamentals data are in a tabulated form so you can accelerate your research. So definitely check that out. All right. Oh, oh, just one last thing. If you guys enjoy this podcast, please uh, like and subscribe and uh, leave us five-star review. That would be super, super helpful. All right. So let's first talk about some of the, some of the recommendations that we put out um, in the membership, and then let's move over into Alibaba. But first... Uh, start us off with the uh, with with two two companies. Let's start off with the uh, franchise group. So, franchise group is a a uh, business that is uh, run by a, a private equity guy who the CEO is actually owns about forty percent of the business through various uh, channels, um, you know, direct ownership and through an LLC, but. What the company essentially does is makes, um, you know, they they buy businesses like sub, several of them are all re, they're all retail based, but like franchise shop, or I'm sorry, vitamin shop, um, some furniture retailers, and uh, additional uh, um, things like pet shop supplies and stuff like that. And what they do is they convert these businesses that are company owned into franchise based, uh, businesses so that other entrepreneurs can, you know, benefit. Um, and it's kind of a win-win because the company gets cash up front and guaranteed cash for every business. And they're able to franchise, you know, thousands of stores across their multiple, uh, uh, business lines. Um, it's, so it kind of diversifies the, the business process. It's a great business. They generate a ton of cash, uh, and they generate a ton of dividend also that they can, or I'm sorry, they have a ton of cash so they can pay a dividend, which I think at this point is almost 10% dividend yield. And last year, the company bought back almost 15% of its, uh, um, uh, of its shares outstanding. So this is a business that's got a, a lot of potential, uh, going forward because they're constantly converting their company owned franchises, which will be a huge tailwind for them. Um, but they also have the ability to acquire a, a lot of new business uh, groups over the next, you know, several years. Um, so it's a great business, very well run. Um, and the CEO is extremely capital uh, efficient and cap uh, a great capital allocator. So I'd highly recommend it. Um, and it's it's trading at a fairly good price right now. Yeah. So this company, if you look at their fundamentals on our database, or just look at it on your own on 10 Ks, you'll notice that there is a slight difference. You'll, you'll notice that there is a, a change, um, in 2020. Yeah. 
2020. And that's when the new management took over. So just, just take that into consideration. If you guys want our write-up, it's on our website. So go to valueinvestor.org. And if you go to their blog, we wrote uh, a blog about, about this. Uh, the title is Three Bagger Opportunity. I think the title kind of shows the, how we're thinking about this company. Yeah. There are a lot of people that, you know, are, are wondering like, wh why is it that you have a company with such a short operating history under new management? Um, why are you, um, confident that they're going to be able to grow? Why is this not, you know, speculation that the company is, you know, and I, I would tell you that, you know, speculation has nothing to do with how long a company has an operating history. It has nothing to do with that. It is the ability for a business for, for the investment that you have to protect the principle that you put into it and to provide a reasonable rate of return, right? That's the definition of an investment versus speculation. So a company like this has a lo very long operating history of each of its businesses, vitamin shop and pet shop supplies and all of these other companies have been around for you know years. Um, all they're doing is changing the business model to a franchise you know, setup, right? So I, I would not be turned off by an, you know, a short operating history. Um, this is a company that generates a ton of cash and has the ability to uh, use that cash to, you know, continue to grow. So mm -hmm. I think that's a, that's a very important distinction for how you operate uh, when you invest. That's a good, that's a good perspective. And one of the things that you highlighted there, I think it, it deserves more attention is the CEO's alignment with the shareholders. When yeah. I see that, it's like, you know, maybe half of the checklist is sort of, you know, I, I tend to look at that as a really, really good sign that things will work out. Um, not always. I've definitely had cases where the CEO owns a big chunk of the company. It doesn't work out the way you want to, but it's a, it's a good sign. So definitely encourage people to look into this more. And again, um, again, if you guys want to, if you guys want the full analysis of it and want to talk about it with us and with the rest of our community, feel free. You know, definitely ch check out our website, go to valueinvestor.org slash membership. All right, let's move on to the next recommendation. So the, uh, the second company is called Harrow Health. Um, what this company does is, uh, originally they were, they were only founded in 2014. Um, the owner, uh, CEO, C I'm sorry, CEO slash chairman is a, uh, guy who started the business by noticing that the ophthalmology industry is very, um, you know, the, the doctors who are performing procedures who are ophthalmologists, I should say, are, uh, very frustrated by the, the process of actually working with vendors. Um, it's very complicated. Um, and so he just essentially streamlined this process to be able to provide, uh, a network to a network of his, uh, group of ophthalmologists. Um, easy way access to medications and specifically compounded drugs. Um, so from zero, he's taken that business to an 80 plus million dollar a year in revenue business. Now that business is a, is interesting, but it's not as interesting as what is coming forward. Um, so I, I want to emphasize something that this is very critical about understanding this. And a lot of people are not really getting it from the comments I'm seeing, but you know, in order to have this kind of relationship, you have to have boots on the ground. So it's a distribution network that is very, very hard to top. Um, and because it's a small scale and a very niche industry, you're not going to be able to get um, this if you're a big player. And so what is happening is a bunch of companies like Novartis have a portfolio of branded uh, drugs that they are able to, they're not able to monetize fully because they don't have a, a network of uh, sales reps and people to, you know, essentially service ophthalmologists. So what, um, the CEO here has done has actually created a very strong deep moat, provided distribution network to ophthalmologists. And now what he's doing is he's acquiring more channels of drugs. So one of the things that they bought was called, um, it was from Novartis was a, a portfolio of five drugs that they paid $180 million for. So they're, they're only paying 140 upfront. And then the fifth drug is, um, going to become, 
potentially uh, another uh, 40 million on top of that. But these five drugs actually generate about $200 million in revenue. So if you remember what I just talked about, they are 80 million in revenue on their own. They're adding 200 million in revenue. And this should generate about 40 or $50 million that goes straight to the bottom line. So this is a company that um, now that they have the distribution network in the next two or three years, they're just going to have an enormous inflow of um, capital that will, you know, or, or revenue because they're going to have just keep adding drugs to this portfolio that they're able to then sell through their distribution network. So yeah. I think this is a really critical un thing to understand about sales. Um, and Becco and I actually talk about this all the time. Uh, a distribution network basically allows you to sell ice to the Eskimos, right? Once you have that in place, which is very difficult to get, you can sell a variety of products, right? And so again, people are saying, telling me, well, this is speculation that they don't have an operating history that they're gonna be able to execute on this. These are drugs everybody's buying already. They're just not able to buy them through Harrow Health. They're having to go through multiple different supply chains and vendors to get there. So now Harrow Health is just basically making it, oh, you want this extra thing? Add a, you know, click a checkbox here and it'll just show up tomorrow, right? So this is this is really critical to understanding like, you know, this. They are not, they are just basically adding channels of distribution to their um, uh, their existing portfolio. It's like a company, um, you know, getting an exclusive ability to sell an iPhone is essentially what this is, right? Because these drugs are branded medications that are sold under a specific, uh, you know, company label. You can't, you know, there's a patent protection and other things that come with this. So by being able to get this license, they're able to go and, uh, you know, distribute this through their exclusive channel. And this should be a huge, you know, windfall for them going forward. Um, and even if they execute just half as well, it's still going to make them a ton of money. Um, yeah, I think the I think the the part about the distribution I think d deserves a lot of attention. Um, you know, like like you know, like you and I always talk about distribution game is perhaps more important. And perhaps in this case, in the medical space and the healthcare space, distribution is, is the king. And the fact that they have the distribution already laid, I mean, this is the playbook for a lot of companies out there, right? The, why, the reason why Microsoft is so successful is because is they, they have that distribution that they have cultivated over many, many decades. They can add a bunch of stuff and bundle it and just sell it through their distribution network. In fact, if you think about like Shark Tank, just just as an ana analogy, Shark Tank, all the all the sharks, right? The people that go out there and and you know buy these companies, the way that they're thinking about these companies that they're presented to them is: Can I attach this product to my existing distribution network? That's how they're thinking about it. And if 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 the answer is resounding yes, oh, I just need to create you know one SKU on my distribution network and it'll sell then it's a very easy game for them. But if they need to create a whole, nip whole different distribution channel, that's, that's a, that's a no-go. So. Yeah. I, and I think it's really important to Becco to understand, like, if you have a distribution channel, right, that channel is really, I mean, think about it. You have a, like the greatest bag of chips ever made, right? If nobody will knows about it, right you're never going to be, really be able to get much in the way of sales, right? So you go and partner with a group like Amazon or Walmart, right? And then Amazon is your distribution network because, you, and you may have to actually pay them to show up on their, you know, search you def, engine. And, you yeah, definitely pay the Amazon you know, you tax def, for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Right. And that's how, but that's how you show up, right? So you can build your separate distribution network, but what happens is there's a lot of companies that don't have the ability to, you know, or the capital to go build out their own network. So they go to the Walmarts and the Amazons of the world, uh, the grocery store chains, et cetera, whatever it is, whatever product you're doing to sell through that um, thing, you know, through that channel, right? So it's, it's a really critical part of this is this guy has built a niche distribution network to doctors who trust this guy, you know, his recommendations. 
they, now he, they're looking at FDA cleared branded products as opposed to compounded drugs, which have no, uh, you know, aren't necessarily cleared. And, and they, they, you know, and he's already servicing 20% of the cataract market, for example. So if you have a cataract, one fifth of them are going to be serviced by this company. So you just continue to, uh, and they're selling, you know, multiple branded drugs into that with FDA clearance and all of this that they're, pay, you know, that are already paid for. Right. So the way I look at it is like, they're just adding an extra business line and the cost is already baked into, you know, this. So they're just leveraging all of the expenses they've already paid to build this dis distribution network. So, you know, what we're really looking for is this asymmetric, excuse me, asymmetric bet, right? Which is heads, I win a lot, tails, I don't lose, right? And that's really what this is, right? Is this thing spectacularly fails. They still have that compounded drug business that, you know, and, and it's going to be worth a little bit less because they've paid debt for it. But everything is pointing to them, you know, just taking off and doing really well. Um, because they've already got, and they've got the know-how and knowledge and the, the ear of every ophthalmologist in the country, or will soon will have the ear of every ophthalmologist in the country. Mm -hmm. And if you guys want to learn more about it, uh, we did a write-up on this company as well. Definitely check out our blog, valueinvestor.org slash blog slash strong catalyst in 23. Definitely go check it out. And if you do join us, um, you could also uh, join us uh, every month for a meetup uh, and you can talk about these companies. Or if you have questions, you can email us, um, but you'll have to sign up to to be able to do all of that. Yeah, yeah. There'll, there'll uh, you know, Hari mentioned there are some comments on this company. The comments are on the, on the membership. So for every recommendations that we put out there, we create a separate channel for every recommendations and... This is where we can debate it out and talk about it. So if you guys uh, definitely want to, if you guys want to talk about them, talk about some of these companies and more, definitely check us out at valueinvestor.org. All right, now let's move over to Alibaba. So what's happening with Alibaba? What's the, what's the headline right now, Hari? So um, for... 2022, uh, in 2020, Alibaba's founder, Jack Ma, kind of disappeared from the public. Um, and there's a lot of speculation. He had made some uh, comments that were, you know, appeared critical of the Chinese government about um, Ant Financial, which is one of Alibaba's products, um, product lines that was trying to go public uh, in a dual listing. And what ended up happening was... Um, he kind of disappeared, right? And so people were like, you know, is this guy kind of disappeared? <laughs> yes. is, he, is he like six feet under the ground, or you know, <laughs> or what? But so anyway, J Jack Ma now pops up again. So I guess you know they dug him up, dug up his corpse, and <laughs> they're weekending at Bernie's him right now. Um, <laughs> but I think you know what what they're what's really going on is China is getting pummeled right now in the their economy is just getting destroyed because um, the last three years they've had really hard lockdowns um, and they've only recently eased that up. So far longer than anybody else, you know, they've, they've, and you know, their zero COVID policy has taken them nowhere. And so they're, they're looking at their tech sector to kind of come back so that they can keep economic growth going forward. Right. And you, you got to remember like um, China has had a lot of, uh, real estate, you know, most of their wealth is trapped in real estate. So they're, they need to diversify their economy, uh, in order to keep growing. So what they've done is they've made a big announcement, um, that should unlock shareholder value, which is they're going to split Alibaba into six different companies, six different operating businesses, um, that will allow them to, you know, be more nimble and grow in the marketplace. Yeah. I think one of the things that um, that we have to think about here is what are some of the headwinds that China is facing right now? And I'm going to do a quick plug here. I love this guy. And if you guys haven't listened to him, definitely check him out. Peter Zion. He uh, wrote a book about this, 
the end of the world is just the beginning. Amazing book. It talks about some of the headwinds that China is facing, specifically China. And one of the big ones is population collapse. Uh, and there are whole sorts of other things that come from it. Um, yeah, that's it. Uh, he is, he's a geopolitical strategist, and he talks about China as he 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 claims that this decade is the last decade for for China, and I think the Chinese Communist Party is feeling some of the pain right now. And I wonder I wonder what this means for the tech sector at China, right? So we got big players like Alibaba, Tencent, and let's sp specifically zoom in on Alibaba. It's gonna split it. It's gonna be split into six different companies. What does that mean for the shareholders? I know you were a shareholder, Hari, or you were or you weren't. Yeah, um, <clears throat> I am no longer, but um, I have been for a long time because one of my biggest problems was uh, it had seemed certainly that Alibaba had lost favor with the Chinese government. Chinese government was concerned that Alibaba had grown too big. And so they kind of slapped uh, Alibaba around for a little bit to show their, put their weight behind it. And, um, what ended up happening is I kind of lost, like, I think Alibaba is a great business, very high return on capital. Um, but because they were, uh, limiting its, uh, ability to grow that I had no good way of, you know, taking my capital out of that business. Yeah. I mean, I think this is, this was the risk that that you had considered before, which is that you're investing in a Chinese company and you're effectively investing in a, in a, in a proxy of the Chinese Communist party. And that comes with a lot yep. of risk there. And I think that's what you've, what you've noticed with China, with, with, with Alibaba and then some other companies that you considered investing in and did invest in. I think that there's a, there's a, there's a risk associated with that. So what, what does that, let's right. go back to, let's go back to what does that mean for the share price? What does that mean for the investors right now uh, that are U.S. Well, based or just in the West generally who invested in Alibaba? So I, I think, you know, there's a lot of people are very bullish on the stock because the stock price had gotten down to fairly ridiculously, you know, uh, ridiculous levels. And this led to a huge bump in the share price. And I mean, I, I think even Charlie Munger had kind of dumped the stock after having been yeah. very positive about it. Um, but I, I think here's where I think it's going to be very interesting. Uh, Alibaba's retail business had kind of plateaued. Now, I think that could potentially come back to, you know, high single digit, you know, growth. Um, but I think the real driver for them has been just like Amazon had been their data center business. Um, and so... Their cloud hosting business would be independent in this reorganization from Alibaba's main entity, or, or I'm sorry, the, the retail business. Um, and I think what will end up happening is that business is going to grow like crazy. Um, you know, and it's going to have like 10 or 15 years of like 20 plus percent growth, because I think there are a lot of companies in China that are going to move to the cloud, just like they're moving to the cloud in the U.S., and, and so I think the re end result of all of that is if you owned Alibaba shares, you're going to get shares in the new six new entities. Um, and what this will do is um, get the data center business basically for a, I think for a very discounted price. And then I think you'd have to look at the other four businesses outside of retail and the data center to see, because I think there's some of them that are much smaller entities in this you know, entire space that I don't know have the same level of value, but I think the data center one is the one everybody wants. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the the Amazons of the world, the cloud cloud vendors of the world. I think Alibaba Cloud is right there with, perhaps they are the they are bigger than GCP and Azure. And I think they're right up there with AWS in terms of, yep. in terms of the volume. So definitely something to watch out for. Uh, but for me, this is just, I'll just express my personal opinion on this. I think the, the nebulousness with the Chinese government prevents me from touching this, even though I, I think that, you know, AWS 
like AWS, Alibaba Cloud will grow. It's just something that um, that just it just provides a level of uncertainty that I don't I don't feel comfortable dealing with. And this comes from personal experience investing in a Chinese company. You and I both did. Yep. Together, it's just something that I would like to not have to worry about again. So that that's my take on it. I th I think there is some bullishness here with the spinoff. Um, yeah. What do you think? Yeah. I mean, I think there is, I, if, you know, one of the most important things about an investment is to be able to see the entire landscape and then pick the, the investments that are going to be the most successful, right? So you have to do what you have to consider here is if I put a dollar into Alibaba, I don't have a dollar to put into franchise group or into Harrow Health, right? And in my opinion, right, um, and, and it doesn't mean that you don't own Alibaba shares, right? But you have to look at it as what is the growth potential for all of these businesses, right? Harrow Health has a very long runway for growth. Um, I think in the next 10 or 15 years is going to be a, you know, a 10, 15 bagger at least in my mind. You have to see, is that going to be what Alibaba is going to be able to deliver for you uh, going forward? And so I think this is a really critical part of, that we don't really talk a whole lot about, which is portfolio allocation, right? You can't own everything. If you do own everything, you're basically owning like an index and you're going to get index-like returns, right? So you want a somewhat concentrated portfolio of probably five to eight stocks that are going to be the best investments that you have. And you probably want to have some cash so that you can enter if, if into a new position if something gets cheap. Like if the Value Investor Chatter podcast recommends a great new business next month, um, um, you know, then you would want to be able to, you know, move your money into that, right? Um, so that, that's kind of the way I look at it is I would have to evaluate what are these six businesses going to look like? Cause I haven't seen any of that, uh, documentation. And then from there decide, you know, how do I allocate my portfolio? Mm -hmm. Sure. Yeah. And, and then just, just one thing. Yeah. So the portfolio, portfolio management, and this is basically going, you're basically talking about the opportunity cost when you invest in one thing you're you're foregoing the opportunity to invest in some other things so really weighing that weighing that very carefully is something that you have to do i think another thing that i want to mention as relates to the to uh, chinese companies is there is on in, in the market in the u.s market there is what's called the chinese discount which means that the overhang of the chinese communist party it's gonna you're not gonna get the valuation that you think it deserves because, just because it is a Chinese company. This exists in Chinese companies. This exists in Korean companies. I know it well, um, just because there is the overhang of the risk with you know political tensions and geopolitical tensions in, China, in Korea and then in North Korea. So there are discounts that are applied to companies that are inherently in a position, um, you know, that, that has these risks inherent to their, their company. So just, just, um, think about that as you, as you evaluate Alibaba, if it's something that you're interested in. Yeah. I mean, the other company to invest in is the company that made the clone of Jack Ma that after they, you know, buried him three years ago, they've cloned him, brought him back. He dances around for the camera and then, you know, they'll probably finish him off again. <laughs> you should invest in that business because that's that's a future growth. You know, they did business. a really good job. I mean, perhaps ChatGPT yeah. that can add, you know, add ChatGPT and. Oh, I, <clears throat> you're right. It could have been a deep fake. I, 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 you know, who knows? He may not actually be alive. It's just a deep fake. So, yeah. Um, All right. Um, I think that that's it. That's it for us. Uh, let me just reiterate two companies that we put out. Definitely check those out, Haro Health and Franchise Group. Read more about it on our blog, valueinvestor.org slash blog. And if you guys want to join us, definitely consider that as well, valueinvestor.org slash membership. And if you enjoy this podcast, please like and subscribe and leave us five-star review. That really goes a long way.
All right. That's it for us. Thank you for joining. I'll see you guys next episode. Thanks.